Uh, hello everyone and welcome to BFW 2401 week 11 capital adequacy. This week we have four parts for our topic which is uh, capital adequacy requirements which is the bank capital regulations. As you understand we have discussed capital regulation uh, capital uh, planning in week five and that actually was coming from the management perspective when we talked about the capital target and all these issues in week five. Now, now we are talking also about how much the financial institution should have a capital, but from the perspective of the regulators. And the regulators are international regulators and international regulators, namely Basel Committee or the Secretary of Basel Committee, which is Bank of International Settlement, which actually have coordination and full coordination with all those countries and local regulators. For example, in Malaysia, Bank Nigara Malaysia is coordinating and applying this international regulations coming from Basel. Same thing applies to Australia, Indonesia, and so many countries. Now, the way I divided, the way I divided this, uh, uh, the week, this week uh, lecture and recording, I divided into two parts. The first part, which is this part, uh, just an introduction. I feel it's important that you know it before we proceed to the topic, but it's not required for any future tests or final exam. And second part and the third part is actually the core of this week. And we are talking about introduction about Basel a little bit about the lever what we call the leverage ratio and the risk weighted assets. And in the third part, we will go to the core of it, which is how we calculate the capital adequacy according to the Basel requirement. Now, I want to tell you that when we calculate the capital adequacy according to the regulators, we have two approaches. One approach called the sunrise approach, which is Basel will provide some tables and we have to apply those tables. It's very, very structured and calculate the risk weighted assets and our capital and see whether we are satisfying the ratio or not. Now, and this is coming actually in the third part, which is so much calculations. You can see it in the, in the, in the slides. Uh, it's around 31 slides. And the second approach, which we call it internal approach. Internal approach, the regulator, the local regulator will deal with the uh, local financial institutions and they will follow what we call internal models. That internal models does not depend on tables. So we have two approaches. One approach is the center approach, which is coming from Basel in part three. And the second part is the internal approach which is actually developed and applied by the local regulator and the local financial institution. As far as we are concerned in this class, mainly we are interested in part three of this, of this week, which is actually the standard approach, uh, our requirement according, our tutorial according to that. And I think also the workshop will cover most of it most of what we are talking about part three. Now, having said that, please allow me just to give you some introduction about this uh, capital adequacy and, and how it comes to the picture. So uh, this is actually what we are talking about. So this is actually part three, part one of this week. And uh, as I mentioned, this part is not required uh, for any future tests or exams. and. I just want to tell you the story of Basel and how it comes to the picture and why banks are actually applying it. Before 1974, when this German bank um, was uh, collapsed in Germany, there was no capital regulations. And actually regulators and supervisors were only interested in pricing. They were telling the financial institutions and their jurisdictions, how much they price, what is the price, what is the cost of the loans and all these issues. And they were also concerned about the money supply, but nothing more than that. Now in 1974, and it was in a Friday day, um, 
there was some transactions and the exposures of this bank, Herstat Bank, to the American banks. So because of the time zones, there is always, specifically when it comes to the exchange rate, uh, there will be uh, some uh, uh, transactions, for example, in Japan, in Tokyo in the morning. If they execute the transaction in the morning and the American banks are the one who are going to, 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 to pay, then in this case, the settlement will happen in the second day because by the time the American banks open, the Japanese bank are closing. Same thing happened to the European banks, including the German banks. If they execute the transaction in the afternoon, now and the uh, by the time the American banks uh, open uh, or execute that transaction, the uh, the German banks may be closed and the settlements will happen in the second day. And this is what happened with Herstat Bank. So they have this huge exposure with the American banks on Friday. When the bank closed, the American banks executed the transactions. But over the weekend, the German, that bank has already some problem, Herstat Bank. The German authorities liquidated Herstat Bank. So by Monday, when they come, there is no payments and there was huge exposures and it was like a crisis and um, all those lending among banks and interbanks and the international bank was frozen. So they decided to do something about it to protect banks from collapsing. So it, there was a call by the, what we call the mayor of the central bank of, of, of uh, the UK. And then they started to, uh, 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 to meet in Basel. Basel is a city in Switzerland. Uh, they meet there and they started to actually regulate the, what we call the uh, capital. And they decided, they agreed, all those big economies, they agreed to uh, make a 6% capital requirement for all banks. And this has to be across the board for all those banks. This happened actually from 1974 until 1989. So before 1989, every bank has to apply 6%. But then in 1989, the Japanese come to the picture and they say, when you are asking for 6% capital to buffer all those risks of transactions, my risk is different from European banks, from American banks. You, uh, European banks are different from African banks, from South American banks, from Central American banks from Middle Eastern banks. So actually the risk is not equal. And 6% is a free shirt to, for everybody to wear is not the right thing to do. We have to have a specification that reflects the cost, uh, the, the risk. So they come with what we call the credit risk or the risk weighted assets. You have all those assets. Last time they will take the equity divided by the capital, by the total assets. Now they come to the total assets and they say the risk of those uh, assets, how, they, how risky they are in terms of credit risk, in terms of market risk, in terms of operational risk, in terms of securitization, in terms of interest rate of the banking book. This is what actually uh, Basel III is talking about. But before Basel III, we have Basel I, Basel I uh, uh, updated, so Basel one come in 1989, then 1998 was another Basel, 1999, 2008, Basel two, and Basel three is coming in 2013. So actually that leverage ratio, which is capital over total assets should equal 6% is not working anymore. The total asset down now is becoming risk weighted assets. And when we say risk weighted assets, we have to come to each asset, each loan, or each investment, any asset we have, and see how much uh, how much the risk of it. Is it 0%, is it 5%, is it 10%? And by that way, you can actually uh, uh, reply to the, uh, you know, the concerns of the Japanese bank. And Later on, the, the, the Japanese were talking actually about the credit risk. 
But then 1998, there was another issue about market risks because the markets are different. The risk of the markets, the volatility in the stock market is different from Japanese banks to European banks to African banks, I said. So they introduced what we call the market risk. Then they introduced the operational risk and they continue adding all those risks until to, uh, they reach to what we are talking about. So this is actually the development of, of the capital advocacy from 1974 until today. And if you want to look at the story, it started here in 1998. There was no thing before when Basel One started. And then they came with Basel One, as I told you, risk-based asset for credit risk in 1998 and 1988. And then 1998, after 10 years, they add the market risk. And then when Basel Two came, they take they have two pillars now, uh, three pillars. Pillar one was about this equation of calculating the risk weighted assets, which they include risk, mat, um, uh, credit risk, market risk, and the operational risk. And pillar two, they talk about something about the management, which is actually no calculations, but what you should do in the management so you can improve. Uh, the uh, decrease the risk. And in Baylor 3, they were talking about what kind of information the bank should uh, uh, disclose so they can activate the market discipline where the investors and the shareholders can react according to that. And all those they think are actually requirements to control the risk. So this is actually the, the, uh, the, uh, the issues. Now, let me, I take a real examples. Actually, I take the data of my bank, CIMB and National Australian Bank. And I take the total asset in 2014 and I applied the 6%. These 6%, as I told you, which was applied before 1989. Look, this bank, for example, uh, my bank should have 38, for, uh, 38 billion. Uh, for CIMB, 20 billion. And then uh, for the National Australian Bank, they should have around uh, 52 billion. This is if you are actually assuming you uh, taking the leverage ratio, which is the issues that was uh, uh, valid before 1989. If you come now, I take the same data. This is the same data. A risk weighted assets now in millions in 2014 and 2014, but I didn't take the total assets. I take only the risk weighted asset according to Basel. And I multiply it by the 7% because Basel have 7% equity, 8.5 tier one and 10.5 for total capital. This before 89, was only for the equity. So I also applied the equity. And you can see now, the uh, uh, if you take the equity or if you take the total capital, you will find that uh, Maybank actually has dropped a little bit when they introduced this. Um, CIMB was increasing but they were having big improvements in the equity, but in the total capital, which is the requirement now of Basel, um, is less. And also because uh, it's, it's higher a little bit here, National Australian Bank is dropped from 52 billion to 38 billion in the total capital. And this is only the equities, which means it's, it gets a lot of benefit in saving the, uh, uh, and the cost of capital because it dropped the required capital for um, National Australia Bank had dropped dramatically. And this is why we are saying now, that means National Australian Bank is actually less riskier in their loans than the other banks. Now we cannot say they are less riskier or more riskier if we are just applying the 6%. The 6% will apply to everyone based on their total assets. Here, you will apply all those ratios based on the riskiness of the, um, of the loans. And therefore, you can penalize people who are taking risk and actually reward people who are 
taking less risk by imposing less or more capital. This is actually, if you want to look at the picture uh, from this perspective. Now, this is about it, but just one more. Um, I didn't include this even. Uh, just if you, if you have some of the questions in your, in your head. So what is Basel Accord timeline? So the timeline for implementation for Basel III is actually Basel III Accord timeline. It started in 2013 and they give bank time to apply it in 2019. And most banks have done it, including the Australian and Malaysian banks. What is the Basel Committee? What is the Bank of International Settlement? Basel Committee is those huge, for example, now the G20, great 20 economies in the world. And what is the Bank of International Settlement? It is actually the secretary of Basel Committee who will do these regulations and who will send it to the banks. It's like a secretary. The committee is just the mayors of all those central banks in the G20. As you can see now, um, uh, BIS is actually, when we see requirements, uh, BIS, but we mean it's actually coming from the Basel Committee. So uh, this is just some explanation about it. Why countries need to apply Basel? You can't choose not to apply. But the problem is if you have any international transactions or connections, your cost of capital will be higher. Your rating by the, those uh, rating agencies will be lower if you are not complying with uh, Basel Accord. So end of the day, you have to comply. What is the situation in Australia and Malaysia? They are actually, both countries are complying with Basel and they have applied it and they take this applies to most countries around us and for those default economies. Thank you very much. I am done with this, with this part and I hope it's, uh, it gives you some introduction about what we are uh, talking about. Uh, thank you and I will see you in the second part. Bye-bye.